What's up, everybody? This episode is brought to you by Luxury Driver, makers of some incredible, portable, easy to use, and really effective wipes. These cleaning wipes have all different kinds of purposes. In fact, there's four different distinct kinds. There's the glass wipes, leather wipes, protectant wipes, and cleaning wipes. And I've tried all of them. They're all really nice. You got packs, the, the big the big round cans you can put in your garage, and then you've got the disposable ones you can put in your car. You just throw them in the glove box, and they basically can help you keep all those areas of your car clean that are more than just a wash and a vacuum. Like, I'm very spoiled. I have a detail shop here at our studio. I'm guessing most of you don't have that. If you're fortunate enough, maybe you've got a driveway with a hose and a bucket and a vacuum. That's all most people really have at home. But the luxury driver wipes help you get those little details, important but sometimes overlooked details, sparkling inside and out from your windshield to your interior and your wheels, your interior dash, your seats, your windows, all of it. Each package of 24 wipes comes in a resealable pack that's convenient to keep in your car so you can touch up your ride whenever and wherever you need. Most folks like to stash them in a door pocket or the glove box so they're handy whenever you need them. The glass wipes are streak-free and ammonia-free, safe to use on tint, and have a light, fresh scent so your windows are left clean and your car is left smelling great. The leather wipes protect against UV damage and they're good on car seats, even purses, shoes, jackets, and more, and they condition as they clean. The protectant wipes are excellent on rubber dull interior surfaces, even your tires and your rubber trim, they can leave just a hint of the cool shine that boasts high class and a well-maintained ride, but without being greasy. And the cleaning wipes are basically pre-moistened to effectively clean and deodorize non-porous surfaces in one quick step. They easily remove grime, dust, dirt on dashboards, console, steering wheel, etc. All come in resealable packages for compact, easy storage on the go or in the big round plastic cans for use in your home garage. They are excellent. I've been using them on, uh, on my cars here at the shop for a couple weeks now. And you can get them with a special holiday price by clicking the link in the description of this podcast and going straight to the Luxury Driver Amazon shop. They've got special deals for you for the holidays and they won't last long while supplies last and while holidays last. So thanks to Luxury Driver for sponsoring today's podcast. Also brought to you by Valvoline the original motor oil. Did you know that Valvoline is America's very first motor oil brand? And for 150 years, they have been innovating, creating, and reinventing motor oil. From the first high mileage, to the first synthetic blend, to the first racing oil, they've never stopped pursuing innovation to maximize engine life. Valvoline's latest innovation, extended protection full synthetic motor oil, provides 50% better wear protection than industry standards, and is 10 times stronger against oil breakdown. Extended protection is specifically formulated with dual defense additive technology combining an innovative additive boosted with a fortified detergent system. You may not think you're a severe driver, but if you go on short trips, if you tow, drive in extreme hot or cold temperatures, you've got a turbocharged engine or heavy loaded van or SUV, or if you go on spirited drives in the canyons, all these things put extra pressure on your engine. Influencers like Chris Forsberg, Rob Dom, Freddie Tavares, Hernandez, Speed Academy, Gears and Gasoline, Dustin Williams, and TJ Hunt all trust Valvoline in their cars. I love Valvoline because of their 150 year history and everything they've accomplished, which gives me confidence that I'm putting a high quality motor oil in my car. Valvoline is the only motor oil with a dedicated engine lab where they can run specialized engine testing and standardized testing right in their own facility. Valvoline is the world's number one supplier of EV battery fluids, offering tailored products to help extend vehicle range and efficiency. And they're proud to be the official motor oil of Hendrick Motors. Sports. This year, Valvoline driver Kyle Larson was crowned the 2021 NASCAR Cup Series regular season champion with nine wins and 2,000 laps led. Head down to your local auto parts store and ask for Valvoline by name. Today's episode is also brought to you by Viore. I am stoked. 
stoked on Viore because unlike uh, so many advertisements that we do on this show, this one started by me spending money. I found their store. I went and bought a shirt. I uh, actually bought like three shirts. And it turns out these were the most comfortable, softest, and best moisture wicking shirts I have ever worn. It's uh, a special technical fabric that feels soft, doesn't shrink in the watch or stretch too much when you wear it. And when I sweat in these Viore shirts, I wear the Strato uh, shirts, the sweat is basically, it just gone. You can't see it. Like I am a sweaty person and I get incredibly uncomfortable when I'm like sweaty in public and I live in a very hot climate. I do active things so that can happen. I can get sweaty in public, but the Viore shirts I wear make that sweat totally disappear. It just goes into the atmosphere instead of sticking in my shirt. The shirts are very versatile. You can wear them uh, with workout shorts to the gym. You can wear them with jeans or, ca or like a nice pants uh, with a blazer at night. I've worn them for almost any activity. I wear them on camera. I wear them when doing the podcast. They're very versatile. They're very comfortable. They're a great gift for yourself or someone else in the holiday season, especially uh, if there's a, a, a really active member of your family, a workout enthusiast, or somebody who sweats a lot. Uh, it's easy to find the product that you want on the website. It's very well laid out and easy to use. And I can feel really good about the shirts that I buy because I've now washed them a whole bunch. My oldest Viore shirts are like three or four months old, and they still look brand new. They don't get saggy around the neck. They don't shrink after a bunch of washes. It's a really well-made shirt. They're not the cheapest shirts out there. They're not the most expensive either, but it's an incredibly high-quality product, and I really, really enjoy wearing them. And I've basically stopped wearing all other shirts. Viore's an investment in your happiness. And for our listeners, they're offering 20% off your first purchase. Get yourself some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet at viore.com slash tire. That's, it's not spelled like it sounds. It's pronounced Viore. It's spelled Vuori. V-U-O-R-I dot com slash tire. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash tire. Not only will you get 20% off your first purchase, but enjoy free shipping on all U.S. orders over $75 and free returns. Go to V-U-O-R-I dot com slash tire and discover the versatility of of Viore clothing. Speaking of clothing, what about Stance, baby? Stance makes awesome socks. Like, I got their socks, and like, everyone's gotten, it's like, getting socks as a gift is is like a hack comedy bit at this point. It's like what people who don't like you will buy you, like your, your grandparents who don't know anything about you. Except now, with Stance Apparel, getting socks is a G move, right? They've changed the game. Comfy, colorful gear. People love it. It's guaranteed to make merry with high quality comforts for you and yours. Stance has made gift giving super simple this holiday season. Stance's premium line of socks, apparel, and more always comes to correct with colorful construction, constructions, innovative materials, and choice fits that are built to last. Throw in an all-star curation of A-list collaborators and those lucky recipients on your they nice list have never had it so good. Check out stance.com for all the latest, including several different subscription options that are sure to keep your friends and family feeling great all year round. My favorite designs are the Goonies socks, the Wu-Tang Clan socks, the Bob Marley socks, and actually just the cool like old school looking striped ones that look like basketball players would wear them in the 70s but with more fun and interesting colors. I am into that. They're very comfortable whether I wear them with uh, like fancier shoes or with sneakers. The quality is real nice. They haven't stretched out in the wash and uh, my wife even complimented me on my footwear style. So Stance has the perfect gift for every punk and poet on your list. Go see for yourself. It's easy. Just head over to stance.com, pick out some styles you think your friends and family might like, and enjoy the color and comfort of a life less ordinary with stance.com. Lastly, of course, let's talk about ransomware. 
Ransomware is bad. We've had a bunch of positive things to say so far in this block of ads, but we're going to talk about the negatives because ransomware can mess your life up.com. That's why you need Ignite. Did you know that JBS supplies a quarter of the nation's meat? Meat. A quarter of the nation's meat. You know how much meat we eat here? One company supplies 25 of it, and they got shut down by ransomware. They paid $11 million to get back up and running. The cost of not operating was too great. Colonial Pipeline's billing system compromised by a single leaked password. They paid $4.5 million, and it shut down the pipeline for days. The entire city of Atlanta was shut down for five days due to a ransomware attack in 2018. Can you afford it? Can your business afford it? Ransomware can come for any company in any industry, but small and medium-sized businesses get hurt the worst. They have fewer cyber defenses, so ransomware has more ways to sneak through. Smaller teams and the downtime and reputational damage can be totally devastating. That's why you need Ignite. It's the first ever file system with sophisticated ransomware detection and recovery tools fully baked in. It lets your teams create and share documents in all kinds of software, including Microsoft 365, Google Docs, Slack, Salesforce, DocuSign, and countless others while keeping your company's data safe. They've got the reassurance that technology is protected. Most security software has a horrible user experience. That's not the case with Ignite. It's slick like you expect from a life of using Apple devices. Ignite is a security tool that your teams will love using because it all runs in the background so your team can work without disruption. There's total visibility, so you know exactly where key documents are and who has access. It automatically detects more than 2,000 ransomware variants and flags unusual behaviors. Ignite is totally turnkey. There's no on-site or hardware or software needed. You can shut down compromised accounts, quickly identify and restore encrypted files, all from a single cloud-based platform. And if ransomware does sneak through, you can restore your files fast and be back up and running in hours, not days, without having to pay the bad guys one penny. Ransomware attacks might be inevitable, but losing your valuable data is not. It's all about being prepared. With Ignite, you won't need a specialized security ops team to keep up. The system is always learning and adapting to new threats. Your team does business like they always have, and you can rest easy. So, learn more about how Ignite can protect your business from ransomware or see why Ignite is rated number one for data security by real customers in G2 Crowd. So, start your free trial today at Ignite.com. That's E G N Y T E. Dot com. E-G-N-Y-T-E dot com. All right, folks, on this episode of the podcast, we've got really some head honchos in from Lotus. We've got Gavin, Matt, and Russell, who are three people in charge of all different aspects of, uh, of Lotus's sports cars. Uh, Russell is in charge of the design, Gavin's in charge of the dynamics, and Matt is in charge of the whole program, really. And we're talking about the new Emira. We're talking about the Evaya hypercar. We're talking about some fun stories from the history and development, uh, as well as what it takes to get in the gig. How do these guys get to be in charge of everything at Lotus? The stories might surprise you. So Lotus's head team of folks is in studio today talking about their new plans and their new sports cars on the Smoking Tire podcast. Uh, w- this morning when uh, when we posted that you guys would be here, Jethro Bovington emailed me. Mm-hmm. He said, are you going to have Gav on the show? I said, <laughs> yes. And he said, back in the auto car days, we used to have a drifting challenge. And we would have Formula One drivers and rally drivers and all these different folks come in. And Gavin would beat them. Yeah, I think we won it four years on the trot. Mate. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Who is the highest ranking global driver for you to have beaten in that contest? Wow. Uh, Colin McRae. <laughs> <laughs> Travis who's, Pastrana. Who's that? Uh, <laughs> what? What cars uh, were you guys driving? Um, he used to just throw different cars at you. So to start with, the auto car <laughs> one, you'd have like a M3 something like that uh-huh. which most people could do and then they'd put a weird car in like a racing car a sprint car 
Formula One, not a Formula One, but a Formula like One stock a, car. R5 Turbo 2, Whoa. like yeah. something really, really wonky. And then um, when we did it in America uh, against Robbie Gordon, Travis Pastrana and that, it was a Corvette and a okay. 911, so okay. totally well, different techniques. Totally different techniques indeed. Yeah. And you won that one too? Yeah, I won that one as well. See, that's awesome. That was, Let's I'm, go all the good stories. I'm glad I I'm glad I brought that one up. <laughs> Thanks, Jethro. Shout out to Jethro for that one. Yeah. That's amazing. So your 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 job is to make sure the cars drive right. Yeah, drive straight. Yeah, yeah all right. So I, mean, I think you've been put in the appropriate position, haven't you? Yeah, no. That's yeah, brilliant. Yes, yeah, it's, it's great. You know, a working for Lotus from a, the age of 15, 16, all the way through, and all the different cars. So yeah, so where is that really when you started? Yeah, we started at sixteen years old, and been what was your job since. at sixteen years old? Uh, we used to do full apprenticeship, so really great in England engineering. So you'd be picked up from school, um, sent to college for a full time for a year to learn all tool making so using your hands welding uh-huh. and then four to five months in every department within Lotus Engineering wow and then you got to pick where you wanted to be and I chose ride and handling so that's a pretty good gig I like that yeah no it's fantastic did you do that too Russell I knew that's what he did but uh, no did, what how did you get in oh sorry how did, how did I gig? get into it oh I joined in 1990 so uh, I worked for a company called MGAA in Coventry that were doing work for Lotus. Uh And then I got a call from Julian Thompson, who was then the design director. Uh And he said he's looking to expand the studio, want some young designers. 1990, that would have been like Esprit, Elan era, era, right? Exactly, yeah. And did I know anybody with a couple of years' experience? So I gave him a whole load of names. And then the day later, the penny drops. I, I phoned him up and said, what about me? Yeah. And he said, well, I'm not officially allowed to poach from uh, your company. But if oh. You, but if you contact me. So that's where it all started. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was waiting for you to kick kick the can back around. Well, that's what I like to think yeah. anyway. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> what about yourself, man? How did you get in this game? I went the same route as Gav. Oh, did you? Yeah. I was apprentice? A, I was an apprentice, but uh, I ended up doing manual drafting. So I was pretty good at technical drawing, so I ended up in the drawing office, then went into computer-aided design and then engineering, and, and I've worked at most levels now within, wow, that's within cool. the company. Yeah. How many people working there are from this apprentice program? It seems like a good lifetime gig, huh? I, I did mine somewhere different. Mine was coach building, actually. So oh, really? I used to make like public service vehicles and things like that. A company called Dormobile that's pretty famous in the UK. Called what? Dormobile. And what do they make? Well, they, when I was there, they used to make public service vehicles, but in the past they used to make uh, camper vans, but they were always converting on some different stock. So, oh, yeah. cool. That's kind of neat. Mm. Did you actually physically put make these things, or yeah. was it all, des- all the design portion of it? No, no, I made them as well. You, with the apprenticeship, you get to go around the plant uh-huh. um, and try different things. I was actually I was really good at upholstery, oh. so I ended up in the trim shop quite a bit. Um, yeah, w- whenever they got really busy there, they they bring a few apprentices into the trim shop. But we ended up like having a fight with the uh, air staplers, which they didn't like. To- <laughs> 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 Isn't that a scene in like Billy Madison or something? Or the nail guns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. How and does that? Do you ever find yourself like in the trim shop now, like being like, listen, if you if you can't do this right. I am going to step in there. No. <laughs> the, the, pe- the people at Lotus in the trim shop are very skilled. I mean, because they, they make everything by hand. In the, yeah. Even the cutting the materials, stitching the materials. Yeah. They're really good. Who has the best interiors these days? I mean, it's got to be Rolls Royce, right? There's like 75 cows in each Rolls Royce. Yeah, they're pretty it's, special. Aren't it's, they? pretty, it's pretty yeah. serious. I was in the Morgan trim shop once, and that Morgan is like... I don't know what it is about Morgan, but when I was up there at Malvern, I was like, can I just give you money for anything? <laughs> like, you clearly need it, and it's very charming, and it smells like sawdust in here. So, like, what have you got? I can't afford a car, but, like, maybe a <laughs> model or something. <laughs> they were having a license plate auction in this meeting room at Morgan when I was in there. Really? Yeah. yeah. Isn't that that's like a thing they do over there, right? I've they, not heard of that. Yeah, they really protect the hand built bit though as well, don't they, with the bending of the wheel arches around that. that oh, machine. it's an amazing yeah. it's an amazing place to, to watch cars be built. Yeah. I mean it's like not much has changed. You see like three generations of folks working in the in the shop there, it's like cars go down a hill, the like gravity to get <laughs> through the assembly line. It's like you know, you don't really see that There's anymore. Three generations of woodpecker eating yeah. cars. <laughs> yeah. No, it was it I I met so many like I met some really enthusiastic people at Morgan. Oh, it was very, cool. Very special cars. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're weird. But how cool that Lotus has the apprenticeship thing and you could be a lifer. 
true yeah, lifer. It, it breeds loyalty because obviously you see, but also you know the site very well because you've been in all the departments. And I suppose it's more as common now with the graduate schemes within businesses, so people can go into the engineering side. Uh huh. But yeah, it, it's great because sometimes when you leave school you don't really know what you want to do you know you may want to work on cars or engineering and just getting that taste you naturally quite quickly find out what what you like what you don't like well it's cool you get to do all the different departments yeah because they're obviously enormously different yeah it's and saying oh i want to work in cars it's like well what what does that mean i mean it's like it's an enormous world yeah and you have a huge respect then for seeing what all the other guys do they're all you know back to the wall trying to get jobs done as well mm-hmm. so when you put pressure on them yeah you, you've lived their life a little bit which was the hardest which was the hardest thing to do over there where you're like, oh, not this. Electronics, me and electronics never <laughs> went well. I don't really? know what it is, just especially when they make harnesses with the same color wires. What's that all about? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can take apart that spray downstairs and we can see if, it, if it's good, if you like. See if it's got some scotch locks on oh, there and man. stuff like that. <laughs> my, yeah. <laughs> I have an old Lamborghini and it died on me recently. Ooh. And my mechanic said, look, there's some real Radio Shack shit going on in this car. We're going to have to take the whole thing apart and put it back to stock. And I was like, all right, that's how much? And then he sent me a thing, and I went, oh, God. <laughs> well, <laughs> fine. But, yeah, that's pretty much 1980s Italy for you. Yeah, it's not where the red wire turns into a blue one, turns into a yeah. yellow one, and it's still holding the same current, isn't it? Yeah, there's inexplicably a USB <laughs> port there. Like, what the fuck is this for? Like, literally, we found a USB port in my 1988 Lamborghini. Like, what is that? <laughs> well, it's futuristic, what is that? wasn't it? What is that for? <laughs> Someone just added that in, like, 1998, and no one has any idea what it's for. So, yeah, he traced the wire. It went basically nowhere. No. Some, I, don't, I don't know what that was for. <laughs> so anyway, we've got uh, this cool looking new car, which I'm very excited about. Mm-hmm. And I missed the party at Galpin. I'm sorry. They have great parties. There Did was they, a lot of people there. there was about 500 people there. Was it night? really? We yeah. Well, yeah. good night. It was a very good Did night. they have the cigar rolling guy out there, the Cuban guy rolling the cigars? Not that I didn't see him, no. That, we, were, we were busy working. Yeah. Oh, were you? That's, that's <laughs> he not, just got a voice know. bag, yeah. <laughs> but the, I'm excited because it's a very pretty car. Thank you. Yeah, leave that one to Russell. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> so that's exactly. that's my area anyway. So, yeah. uh, it's beautiful. Thank you very much. At least yeah. from what I've seen in photographs. I haven't seen in, in person yet. No, well, thank you for that. No. Well, we, that's what we obviously try and do is do cars that are technically fantastic, but also beautiful to look at as well. Yeah. Is it about the same size as Avora? It's pretty much the same size, yeah. It's a little bit wider. We've uh-huh. gone up to just under an inch in width. Uh, but about the same height. But we always try and keep the cars compact because that's obviously good for weight efficiency. It's good for dynamics for this man here as well. And obviously, uh, in Britain, our roads aren't quite as big as you've got over yeah. here, so we need to keep it compact. Well, our car, our roads have been the same width for 25 years, yeah. and yet the cars still keep getting bigger. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I was just driving something called a Ram TRX. Do you guys know what that is? Well, I know what the Ram brand is, but I don't know. It's the Hellcat one. Oh, okay. It's the, it's the Raptor Baja jumping yeah, yeah. Hellcat one. Yeah. And it is so offensively huge <laughs> that you, you're, you are just a menace to society when you're driving it. You're literally, you're, you in, you're in other people's space. It's really, it's really terrible. But I see, I know what you mean. Yeah. But you have, to, you have the space to use it, right? But we're well, just, uh, not but, here. Maybe in Houston. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> here, here, not so much. But, but certainly on a lot of British roads, oh, no. you want to keep everything a little bit more compact. So. For sure. Is it, uh, I mean, don't take this the wrong way. How much Evora is under that? Any? Not much. Not much, right? No, it's, the, the project was really, how do we move Lotus on, obviously, Matt can explain how we changed um, ownership and shareholder, and there was a bit, we decided to do the Avaya hypercar and then a new sports car. And it was to understand that Lotus wanted to keep all the good things that we were good at, ride handling, aerodynamics and lightweight, but then really improve a new car to make it usable, tractable, storage space, um, A, the new design. But so it's new tub, new subframes, new wishbones, uprights, the car's wider, the occupants sit further apart. No, so even though the the general shape is and size is the same, it's not because we're reusing things. Yeah, Matt loves us that we changed everything and got a car that's about the same size. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not so bad. It might it means you might have been onto something, right? Yeah, I think Gav said it before as well that this is the first time that we had the opportunity to work on every part of the car mm. because of the investment we got in the program. You know, previously, it's been tinkering with bits around the edges and you know maybe making some smaller changes, but this time. We knew the list. We knew we we knew the list of problems with the Avora that we needed to tackle, which was ingress egress, usability, 
uh, comfort, quality, all of those things. But we also wanted to increase the storage. But we, we decided we had a real opportunity to make it better dynamically as well. So the, the wheels have gone up to 20 inch all round. As you said, the track's gone a bit wider. So Gav's been able to get the car that is really, really quite compliant, but still very sporty. It's, 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 um, I got to drive the tour set in last weekend, so uh, yeah. I, oh, I, is it an adjustable suspension? No, we have no. two settings, so we've got tour and sport, uh -huh. and one's designed for, because we were trying to attract people into the brand, and people's first impression of a Lotus, if they've never driven one, is it's going to be really hard, harsh, noisy. So I've driven all of them, and I think that's not true at all. Yeah, so people have to go through yeah. them. You know, even on the highways and freeways out here, they're not hard. No, that's my all. favorite thing about the Evora GT is that even with no adjustments to the suspension at all, you go, it just sort of works in all settings. Yeah, you never, you know, you never lose contact with the ground. Yeah, you never nice. feel like you're being jarred. But then there's the guys that want to put Cup Twos on their car as well and do more track days, canyon driving, things like this. So rather than force things on all customers made a real decision that we go with a tour with you know good year nearly all season tires the f1s and then a sport with a little bit more body control stiffer springs a little bit more oh, we're talking about it. different models of the car not different settings in the suspension no no no, no. you actually book ordered the the customer now has got some real decisions to make that you know what does he use his car for it, oh. a does he want a v6 does he want a well that i I4? hadn't gotten to that that there's two completely different powertrains which is an gearboxes. interesting thing yeah yeah gearbox choice you know manual auto um P dct and then now um a sport and tour chassis as well but at least the exterior always stays the same interior so why how do you end up with t the two completely different powertrains you've got the six supercharged and then now we've got this amg supplied engine right mm -hmm. that that must lead to two drastically different driving cars right I wouldn't say they're drastically uh, different, but they are definitely different. They got uh, um, the i4 engine slightly lighter, so you can you can feel that in the dynamics of the car. Uh, one's turbocharged, one's supercharged, so there's different performance out of them, but different sounds as well. But we wanted we wanted a smaller engine. Um, we need to make this much more of a a worldwide car. China. Oh, China, I see. China will take. A, take a small capacity engine so you need a two liter need mm -hmm. to have a two liter yeah that makes sense and we look for the best two liter out there and it uh, is a pretty rabid two liter isn't yeah. it mm -hmm. i mean we uh we've driven it in the uh the gla 45 which actually is a as far as like mini crossovers go is pretty rowdy that thing mm -hmm. is fun it rips and so that's like as far as a as a did you did you try a variety of different engines and end up on this one or just on the spec sheet went well this is so obviously the one we actually looked in house first and i think oh. that's you know there's been questions around why we've not used geely group uh, engines but that's what's nice about them was we had a look we realized it wouldn't give us what we wanted so we went and had a look outside as well and they support you on that is like we know what a lotus product needs to be mm -hmm. so yeah, they don't direct right you've got to go and use a whatever engine that's in our group so and you know great conversations with amg very early on they were really receptive to they the were project. into it yeah yeah so um but it's good it's good it's a, it's a great car just gives the car different characters as well you know people want to use the cars in different ways so that gives breadth of appeal as well and do and you also have different gear ratios to match the the power bands like that or is it the same uh the V6 comes with the, the manual and an auto, which are similar ratios to the Evora because we've got a similar roll and radius tyre. Mm -hmm. The DCT, because it's eight speed, and we're challenging sort of just over four seconds to 60 and a, you know, 180-odd miles per hour, 190 miles per hour. So Big that's, spread. It's a nice spread, so the gearing's good for that. We change, we have access to the shift speed of the gearbox, things like this, so we can link that with drive mode. So, And that's now, you know, when you buy a car, it's often the gearbox that you want. Do you want a manual with a, a diff in it, or do you want a you know nice auto smooth mm -hmm. upshifts, or do you want a DCT? That's that's probably your primary decision now. Well, that's I mean that's the the, the easiest way to change the character of the car, and other than turning a wheel, you yeah. know that's how you engage with the car. So yeah, and you know for us, you know with the Amira feels like the most complete Lotus. Is ever. it Amira? I've been saying Amira. I'm sorry. It's Amira. Yes, yeah, Amira. Okay, because and it's a Via. It's a Via. It's a Via and a mirror. Okay, I won't. I won't fuck it up again. Sorry. <laughs> All you guys, everyone's coming up. You know how long it took me to say Tycon properly? <laughs> it was like you know. <laughs> Even James May was like, "This bloke in America has told told me it's correct as Tycon." Like, All right, yes, it is. All right, a mirror. Sorry. Excuse so, me. it's 
you know, everything that we've been learning for nearly 70 years as a business and the aluminium architecture, still keeping hold of the hydraulic steering, having a brake booster and a master cylinder so you're connected to the brakes. So then having the option to, you know, the customers to have a manual with a V6 with a big supercharger in it. It's probably their their last chance nearly coming up. You know, it definitely is for a Lotus. There's a lot of these last hur- last hurrah cars are very hot right now. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really exciting time, <laughs> isn't it? You know, you've got the guys with the electric stuff doing their utmost to shatter some records and some figures. Yeah. And then us guys like ourselves still trying to be honest to the driver, but also the way that people use their cars nowadays. Yeah, you've got four or five different options for an electric dragster right now. A lot of ones, everyone's approach is a little different, but... Yeah, and I'm glad some of them are including good brakes. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to admire everyone in the industry. You know, we're all trying to do different things, and it's not easy. You know, and we all try and do all the things we do well. But the electric pro- propulsion, we know on the Avaya, you know, you got a car that will accelerate zero to three hundred k's in under nine seconds. So, That's safe. People should just be allowed to buy that. So you <laughs> no. want some reasonable brakes for no training? Here, isn't it? Uh, please tell me we're mandating training for something like this. I think the training is the you've probably owned a good amount of cars to own it just because of the and <laughs> that is the ultimate sidestep for someone but, who knows just how shady something like that nah, will be the, the car's got a throttle <laughs> pedal hasn't it so it's as fast as you want it to go we with the drive modes again we can tune them so it's only got a mere thousand horsepower in city <laughs> mode something like that <laughs> and so it's it's that isn't it but we you know we developed the car in real life and on the virtual series. We've got simulator for, um, work in the same as an F1 simulator. We have a track at Hethel. A lot of the customers have already experienced the car on the track and things like that. So yeah, it's an ownership experience as well. How close is, uh, is Avaya to being uh, delivered to customers? Uh, it's, that- it's next year. Next yeah. year? Middle of next year, yeah. It, that, that's, that's the one program that's been really hit by the COVID stuff because of the performance that Gav's talking about. You can't do a lot of the high speed work on the tracks or the proving grounds we've got in the UK. They're just too small? Yeah, yeah, and you just you just can't, you haven't got the space. So we've been down to Nardo, been doing some testing down there, and, and the cars were there. As soon as COVID hit, we had to drag them back so they didn't get locked in Europe, and yeah, we've yeah. only just about been able to go back, really. So Don't you have airfields? Don't you have the most number of airfields <laughs> per capita or something? Yeah, yeah double <laughs> lane change at 200 miles per hour. You fa- need a fair bit of space, yeah, like right. about Heathrow. <laughs> Bruntingthorpe isn't, uh, isn't available, it's right? It's gone now, isn't yeah. it? Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. Oh, that was the spot, right? Yeah, we did use that, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Bruntingthorpe, yeah, I think even the Top Gear track now is no more, isn't it? So a lot of them... Oh, is, uh, is Dunsfold gone, too? Yeah, I think they're using a different one. What so. are they putting... Condos there or something? I don't know. I see the car storage. I think Brunding thought was for a while. So oh, they were just parking. Uh, yeah, if you look at the Google overhead view, yeah, there are cars just filling in the big. Oh, runway. really? So I think just... they were making more money just renting space to store cars. Oh, that's depressing, isn't yeah. it? It's from a guy who stores cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he didn't even make a full. I didn't, look, I didn't bulldoze a great racetrack to do it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> could have had a nice speed shop here. Though. There you go. I know. Did, uh, Gavin, did you find as you were testing the uh, the Amira? Is it strange getting used to that much speed with one mirror? Oh, sorry, a mirror. Right, uh, one ge- one gear. Oh, the no, Vi. Sorry, Vi. Vi. That's why I'm, I combine the two of them. Not really, because I it's got so much capacity. The minute you put your foot down, you're being stuffed in the back by just over one G. So it's like hitting the brakes hard in a normal car is what you're feeling acceleration. And then the scenery comes at you so quickly, you just want all of the controls, like the steer and the brakes, you know. And also for us. It wasn't about making it, sounds weird, but completely aggressive. So the car's actually quite fluid. The way that we designed the suspension, it's actually similar to an F1 or an LMP1 car where it actually got a damper and spring that controls the heave. So we generate a lot of downforce. So we can keep the car quite soft and compliant as a Lotus would be. But then when you're ramping up the speed, there's another damper system that controls the aero on the car. And... It's that sensation. The thing that gets you is that it's it never drops off mm-hmm. because actually it's faster in some of the middle speeds because yeah, you can put the long more, gearing, right? Well, you can put more torque on the front tires because obviously you can't put a thousand horsepower through the steered axle when you pull away. Yeah. So once you're up and running straight line, we can start to actually put more power through the the chassis. 
So that that feels a little bit weird when you That's start weird. Like progressive boost. Yeah, I've like driven that, cars yeah. with progressive boost where you you don't get full boost until fourth gear. And yeah. so I, I drove a, a Viper that had been modified to, to 2200 wheel horsepower, and it actually would when you would upshift would pull even harder, which was which is a very unnerving but feeling. We actually prefer it. We call it strength and growth in a car, and, and we even the Lotuses, the Avoras, and things have that where you don't want to feel the initial surge of acceleration, get used to it, and then it's gone. Yeah. So because the load on the car increases as you go faster, the road load, the engine's actually got to produce more torque to actually keep you going at the same acceleration. Mm-hmm. So we want something that right up to what would be the VMAX or the red line, it feels like it's gaining performance rather than falling away from you. What was the learning curve like for you guys on, on going from traditional gasoline-powered cars to not just tuning an EV, but tuning one with batshit horsepower levels? Matt knows that he had to employ a load more people. <laughs> <laughs> Expensive. <Yeah. laughs> no, it's uh, at the end of the day, I suppose it's the dynamic bit of it is set up like Gav said. It it really does. I've I've driven it very tentatively, I must say, but um, it feels like a Lotus when you're driving it. But I think the control systems. Um, uh, the torque that's in the car, then the the functional safety you now have to do if what if what because it's got four motors. So what if one motor goes down? What does it do to the performance of the car and things like that? That's been the steep learning curve. But um, the guys are there. It's safe. We have all our we have to do all our risk assessments and uh, and things before we go out on the road. And yeah. The, and the car's just been building up now, hasn't it? Um, and it did. We, we did 300k the other day, didn't we? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. yeah, we, yeah. We're now looking at all the other systems. You know. How, how it charges, how it shakes hands with different charges around the world and yeah. things like this. Oh, that's so, fun, isn't it? Yeah, there's lots yeah. of that stuff. I don't get so involved with that. And obviously, Russell's, whenever you take it out on the road now, you're, you're at a charge station, you need to be there two hours just for people talking to you. Oh, know? yeah. <laughs> just you know, looking through the big hole down the side, trying to see their mate in the background. Yeah, yeah. Does the one, does the prototype look like the car? Does it, it looks, yeah, like, it looks it's, like the car. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Oh, so that's so got it. still causes a, a real storm when it's seen. On. I saw the, the static on. prototype. It looks insane. It does. It's a really crazy looking thing. Yeah, well, it, that was the intention was to do something which was a, a statement of intent for a new design language and when you're given a hypercar you kind of go, go, go all out so uh, yeah there as you is. can see it looks it, awesome it looks so it wild looks it looks amazing. super wild okay, just for the record. I mean anytime you have like buttresses and tunnels Ooh. you know and stuff that where air goes through the middle of the body and you can see out the other side that's that's wild stuff yeah well, you, you just got to create something that engages people excites them yeah. you don't buy any of these cars on rational reasons you've got to got to be drawn into buying them and make the wallet jump out of the pocket as they used to say so it was fantastic doing that as the the first car in a range of vehicles because you're sort of unbridled you can do almost anything you want and then the opportunity of doing it around an ev package as well just gave us even more freedom to Mm -hmm. do some crazy sculpture and then we're obviously able to take that across to the Amira and all the other cars that we're doing in the future as well so and you can do really fun stuff with led lighting now we can do it, yeah. I mean, the, on this car, the rear lights are something very distinctive. The way that on on the a, sort of butterfly vibe. wing kind of shape. Yeah, the way they trace around the outlet of the so gorgeous three, three quarter Venturi. The interior is extremely wild. Uh, it looks like the seats themselves are fixed, and the controls move to you. Or is that no, the, just so the, 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 the seat moves? It uh, does, but it's a super thin carbon fiber seat with very th- slim pads, but thick enough that they're actually comfortable to sit on. Are you fitting them to the individual customers? We're, well, no, we're not really. We can, are different, we can, yeah, we can yeah. do seat fitting for it, yeah. so it depends. The, the frame will stay pretty much the same, but as we said, we've got pads mm-hmm. in there that we can make thicker or thinner if, if people need them for the or whatever comfort they want. So. Yeah. But one of the things on that car is actually the cabin is a good environment to be in. A lot of, you know, extreme cars are fairly hostile environments, but we... Tr- Sounds ridiculous, but we try to make it a car that you could use on the road quite comfortably. So uh, I always, my team work really closely with Gav because he's obviously got to drive the car at the end of it and make sure that, you know, it's intuitive to drive, but also, you know, it's a good environment to be doing your, the, the job of driving in. Where is, what is the, the layout of the battery pack? Is it a skateboard kind of thing or is it a, a spine? Mm-hmm. How does that work? Or is that so it's behind, it's behind the occupants. It's a, it's it's a, back, che- a backpack. It's a chest battery. It's a chest battery. Yeah. Yeah. It's a ch- oh, a, ch- oh, yeah, a, a chest, chest? Battery, Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah all right. And so that, that gives you... It gets the weight near the centre. Like, we're all sitting on swivelly chairs. Mm-hmm. If you put your arms out, it takes a long time for people to turn you. 
if you clamp yourself in to the center of inertia, the car will rotate really quickly, so it feels mm -hmm. really agile. Mm -hmm. So obviously with the floor-mounted battery pack, A, you'd have to sit much higher. You'd be two hundred, you know, best part of eight inches higher. Mm -hmm. But also the weight goes all the way out to the corners, so you'd, you'd have to have all of the rear steer and things like this just to get the agility that we have naturally. Well, yeah, that's, I guess, in the, in a lot of the very fast EV sedans, that's like the stuff that they do, is they, they do rear steer and they it's, do... It's the way that they get their agility and even park, you know, the, as we said, the cars are getting bigger and bigger. If you want to turn it, you know, you need to put six degrees worth of steer in the rear axle just to park, you know, yeah. turn in the road. For it's the really record, important. I love rear steer in those cars. I mean, it would be nice, I guess, if we didn't need it, but like the fact that it's there, it makes them handle pretty awesome. It makes them, you know, really engaging to drive, but also you can then dial in quite a lot of safety at high speed mm -hmm. if you, you know, lock the steering in a straight line in effect. So, yeah. No, it's got its advantages. Yeah. But the positioning of the battery is also important, just getting the car low, because obviously visually it's important, right. but also aerodynamically. And, you know, aerodynamics has been a key part of all Lotus products and we're really trying to push that you know going forward so on on a mirror we're unusual in our category of being a, a downforce car albeit quite light downforce but a via without was, any big wings without any big wings yeah, yeah using you know all the exterior surfaces but particularly the the underfloor and the venturi to work but obviously on that car on the avaya it's it's at another level and we've still not declared, I don't think, the downforce figures on there, but they're pretty, they're pretty crazy. So, uh. Well, you can just, I mean, even we've got the, uh, the animation up on the screen here. I mean, there's a lot of air that is moving through the car, not just over it and under well, it. Well, the aerodynamics guys call that porosity, yeah, allowing the it's air to breathe. Yeah, it is a good That's word. a good word, porosity, yeah. yeah. Every time I use it, they think it's some sort of designer nonsense being used, but it's a proper engineer's term. When the Ford GT came out in 2018, it was like, oh, oh, shit, yeah. I see what you did there. Yeah, that's pretty. That was cool. That car. Was it that, was. Was that something that you, as a designer or the engineers, had wanted to do for a long time, but you just couldn't because of the manufacturing cost? Yeah, pretty much. And yeah, I know. Yeah, you, the Avaya was obviously a complete new platform where you could position everything in the correct place, basically. So for us, from a visual design standpoint, it was a fantastic opportunity. And for our aerodynamics department, well, they were just let out of the box to do that then. And if you had Richard Hill, our aerodynamics guy here, he would suddenly, you know, go wax lyrical about uh, porosity and how this car was the car he'd been waiting to do for 30 years or something like that. So yeah, a real explosion of uh, technical and visual creativity on that car. Is the actual um, airflow as regards to cooling more or less difficult with EV than with gasoline um, from our standpoint from design point of view it's it's easier because there aren't so many radiators if you were talking about a 2,000 horsepower gasoline powered car oh yeah you would have some serious radiators whereas we you know we're fairly limited on on a buyer mm -hmm. and we position them in a way that looks good and technically works right as well so um, it was I would say it was easier on on doing an EV car well that's good um, and so we have a whole new sort of design language. We've got the, the up here, the million, two million dollars, whatever this thing is, two million dollars, who knows? Yep. Was two, is it two million dollars? Is it? <laughs> uh, what I'm starting to see a bunch of from the real mainstream manufacturers are that they have figured out, not real mainstream, like let's say Ferrari, is they've figured out that they could build, you know, a couple hundred cars for $2 million. And that seems to maybe be a better business model than building a few thousand cars for $200,000. And that is cool because we get they get to really stretch their engineering legs, but also kind of sad because it means that it raises the bar higher for exclusivity. And so... Obviously, with with Amira, it's a it's a, a sports car and an expensive one, but it's a, a you know by by crazy standards, it's fairly fairly accessible. Um, are are you guys working on anything in this new design language that will be very accessible to enthusiasts? Well, see, so you've got Via that's two million dollars, which right. is the Halo product there. But a mirror that's coming out to sports cars is less than a hundred thousand fully loaded. Yeah, so that's, that that is pretty accessible yeah. by modern standards. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's comparable with stuff that's out there. Um, and you're right. The the 
in a way, we kind of like to be where Ferrari is because they, they they can bring out any car and yeah. they've got the people lined up to buy them before they even start them. Whereas um, we weren't sure how that was going to go. And it was really important for us to bring a sports car in um, to replace the three cars that are going out as well. So we couldn't we couldn't bring in a £150,000 car that was going to replace the outgoing Elise at fifty grand. Right. But a mirror is a, it's a, a bit of a stretch for people in that market, but it's not outrageous mm-hmm. um but it gives us room to go both ways either so coming along um after the mirror is we have the next car in in uh it's in russell's studio at the moment it's a way off yet it's 26 when it'll be coming out but um it gives us some scope as well from where we've positioned the sports car at the bottom to go go higher up really that's good don't leave us hanging we don't all have two million dollars to blow on cars i think you know <laughs> you said the Amira. most people will drive that through a canyon it's got the right amount of power. It's got the right performance, and you can enjoy it. You know, and I think that's the that's probably the accessible sports car. If you're lower than that, the the new safety systems, regulation, just size of discs and tires, you know, the the MX fires and things like that, probably to sports car owners don't deliver enough. Nearly, you know, we've been spoilt really by the sort of arms racing effect with the automotive. A little industry, bit, yeah. yeah so. Have you tried the new eighty six? No, I, I can't heard. recommend it highly enough. It's fucking cool. And no. really, yeah, it's fast actually. For for the, the it goes faster than the numbers would suggest. It's it's quite good. And I think you know the Yaris did that for as well as you know, <sighs> we the, haven't had a go- you know we don't get those here. Right, the okay. GR Yaris's. Yeah. It is a shame that we don't get those here because everyone says they're like the greatest thing ever. And I think that's probably a segment that's going to come back, hot hatches and things like this. So that will allow you know me as boys you know you bought hot hatches and stuff like that and you've evolved into sports cars yeah so i think if the hot hatch scene comes back again you know especially with the electrification it's probably a perfect thing for them then that accessibility will come yeah we've had we've actually had a couple of electric hatches here in the u.s that did never really took off but we're actually like the fit honda fit electric yeah. mm-hmm. and the, was it the sonic the chevy sonic I think it was a Chevy Sonic EV that had like 400 pounds of torque yep. in this tiny little <laughs> like nothing car. It was actually very ridiculous. Yeah. So I think, you know, that is the driving experience, isn't it? And that's accessible to everybody, isn't yeah. it, at that point? So yeah, yeah. We've got a Honda E at work, and that's just quite cool just to jump Oh, we don't get out. those either. No. Those things are cool. You're missing out, yeah. Yeah, those are really cool looking. So. That's a bummer that we don't get those. I would I would mess with one of those. Yeah. I have a, we, I have the electric Ford, right. the Mach-E, Mach-E, which mm-hmm. I've actually really gotten a kick out yeah, of it's very cool. very nice to use yeah um electric's not bad electric's all right yeah it's got lots and lots of benefits and yeah. i think it's just getting the world ready for isn't it the ownership experience and you know all yeah. the charging da, 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 public da, 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 charging but, stinks but so hence i think that's why it's the perfect storm for the mirror at the moment that it's that time where people don't have to embrace electricity but the cars, the high-performance petrol cars now are really efficient. You mm-hmm. know, you can travel long distances in them. So, you know, if you want to get it out of your blood and own a sports car, probably the next three, four years is the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Matt, you did mention that the, that one of the reasons for going with the two-liter engine is for the Chinese market and whatever. But is are, but are all three versions of the car going to be available in america will you be able to get that amg motor here yes okay cool. yeah you will in america in china they only want the two liter right they, right they but everywhere else you can get both mm-hmm. yeah oh, okay that's cool yeah i didn't i kind of sidestepped that one before but i can't wait to try that i bet that's gonna be cool but that's gonna be fun it is i like it yeah yeah i always joke because i'm from essex so uh ford territory so i love a turbo anyway so you know it's, uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, does it make cool blow off noises yeah yeah you, you got you got to have that but we're over the burble tunes here. The burble tunes were, were very like 2014. Yeah, you know, we're kind of done with them. We try. We want a car that, for us, is really refined and effect in one way. And then if you go up through the modes, you can have a little bit more, mm-hmm. you know, burble on. You know, but only when you lift it, when you hear a sort of a gear change crack and yeah, stuff yeah. like that, artificial noise and you know, real big pops and bangs and stuff, as you say. People can add them later in their life, isn't it? But you don't want the people who are using it every day, yeah. you know, underground car yeah. parks and stuff. No, people it's are looking really, at you for the wrong reasons. It's really ridiculous. There's yeah. people get the aftermarket tunes where it's like, I, you look like you're going through the pits at Daytona. Like, what are you doing <laughs> with this thing? We still like a nice sounding car, though. Yeah, we go for. yeah the, the V6 sounds amazing. It's V6 really, is good. It's really it characterful. That sounds good. Yeah. And we're now going, you know, we've gone through the loop with the i4. Obviously, it 
produces an actually different tone and with the turbocharger. So we're making it as, let's say, characterful without making it sound thrashy or harsh or too silent. So there's a big um, sort of a, a lab in effect where people, you know, our engineers are working on that all the time. Yeah. Every sound is important. That's, that's something we learned from the Avira as well, because obviously it's not just... You, you get bad sounds as well as good sounds, and you've got to get rid of those. Yeah, with the electric cars, yeah. it's like you you kind of you have to figure out which ones to keep and which ones to get rid of, and right? Yeah, and the Amir is the same. You know, I think probably the biggest work that they've done is reducing road noise. No one wants road noise, wind noise, yeah. and wind rush over panels, things like this. So you can actually concentrate on the nice noises in the car, and that's where, you know, it's one of the things the Evora used to have a few squeaks, rattles, and a bit of character, let's say, noises that are now, you know, after a while you don't want them, and that's where the big push is to get rid of even things like that. Do you have a soundtrack for Avaya? Does it have what we call space Jetsons noises? <laughs> there are some sounds being done for it, actually. Mm, there yeah. are. Yeah, so... Uh, oh, wait, didn't I meet your guy? Yeah. I met your, like, composer guy, yeah, I think, Patrick. right? Patrick. Patrick, Patrick. Yeah, Patrick. yeah, yeah. Patrick he, was, he came yeah. through. He came by the shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did meet him. So is he just in a studio playing with weird, weird yeah. non-instruments to yeah. make Space Jetsons noises right now? Yeah, he, se he sent me a file thing, and I listened to the first one that was a few bings and bongs, and then upset, <laughs> upset him when I said I didn't listen to any more of it. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for hours doing those. I was like, yeah, I've, I've got a kind of company to run. I need to crack on, really. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. and then, you know, you need the pedestrian safety yep. space noises too, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really cool at the moment. All these changes are just new challenges. You know, it makes what we do really fun. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot to learn, but a lot to play with as well. It's a good point, actually. It's refreshing. It's yeah. it's, it's refreshing, refreshing the automotive industry, and you having to different areas work on different challenges that are coming your way. But as we said with Avaya, different opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we. <laughs> It's once in a lifetime for us lot to work on a hypercar, so why not have a bit of fun and um, and and really put it out there, which is what we try to do. With the uh, with the Geely uh, uh, group and all that, is there an opportunity to bring back the handling by Lotus partnerships? Because I have to say, I really miss those from the nineties. It's still available through Lotus Engineering, but um, we have a level what, of... What cars are handling by Lotus? Well, are, we, there, are there cars that are secretly handling by Lotus? We've done a bit of work on some uh, some of the group cars, but they didn't have enough work to win the badge. Oh, so so we, no. we, we've kind of got a scale of work. So if it gets fully tuned uh, and basically you pay for Gav's salary, um, you, you get to put a badge on the back of the car, but if you just have a small tuning update or something. So, so we've got a level of what the amount of work that needs to be done to get yeah. the tuning but, but it is still available I thought those, been used those for Isuzu's back in the yeah, day yeah. were fucking the impulse yeah. handling by yeah. Lotus that yeah. was the shit we've done some great cars some that we can't talk about which you sort of see the reviews in the magazines and sort of smirk uh -huh. uh, and then the ones like you say star <laughs> one what <laughs> and there's the ones that you know we've embrazened with our logo you know in malaysia we had a satria gti uh -huh. and that was amazing it was you know a little hot hatch and it was you know up against all the competitors and it was just brilliant so when when, when a company approaches you and wants your expertise for that i assume there are you know like you said different levels of different amounts of money and sometimes is it can you just align and tune the parts we have or change out bushings or is it all the way to you're going to redesign their control arm design because it's flawed or pick up points or you know i guess like what is the the spread in how much work you can do it would depend on what what they think is wrong with the character typically you know the engineering business they're either coming at the very early stage of the program or just before production. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, hey, I have a paper due tomorrow. <laughs> I need help with it. Yeah. So sometimes it's just a you're only allowed to change the spring and damper and some geometry, and you you're realistic about the targets to start with. And then there's you know as we do from Russell designing a car for somebody through to manufacturing it. You know as we've done with. Opel, Tesla, and lots of other car manufacturers as well. So it's really, yeah, how much time they've got and their budget. And if they actually want the public association with us, you know, some people, you know, are proud of what, what cars they've got on the road and don't necessarily want, you know, that it's been tinkered with by mm -hmm. us. I took a handling by Lotus badge off an Isuzu Bighorn at a junkyard in New Zealand. Right. It made it's me right. laugh very, very hard. <laughs> and they charged me 30 whatever whatever New Zealand dollars for the fucking badge too <laughs> like oh you want to I should pocket it but yeah it's actually stuck on my wall at home 
the handling by Lotus Batch. We've got so much heritage, haven't we? So, you know, from the racing cars, the road cars, you know, Lotus Cortinas, things like this, isn't it? Yeah. Often, uh, you know, the Lotus Carlton, some of our best associations. Love the Carlton. have been amazing opportunities for us. There's LT5 a guy with one of those here in L.A. Really? Is that really good? Yeah. He spent a lot of money getting it here. He's probably familiar with the sheriff as well, I should think, isn't he? Yeah. He, uh, he's got he's got a <laughs> bunch of, he's got a Sierra Cosworth and nice. a bunch of uh, stuff that's been imported from the U.K. It'd been cheaper for him to move countries, wouldn't it? I know, uh, probably. <laughs> yeah. Just the weather's down. You know, let's Did you guys down. check out Radwood by any chance? Do you know about Radwood? I've heard about that. Is that the newer stuff? It's, it's the a, 80s, it's 90s car show. But the L.A. one was this past weekend, and it was amazing. There was some good Lotuses, a couple of Esprits. There was an Elan. Yeah. It was not the, not a nice Elan. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was rough. Yeah. Good, I don't know where he's going to find parts for that thing, but it's seen better days. <laughs> Is it a front-wheel drive one? Or a... The front-wheel drive one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That that's that one was a little it was a little scruffy this particular one, but the Esprit there was a couple of very nice Esprits. I think you know the 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 news of all our new cars and news of the you know big boost in Lotus in general as a brand we've seen in the UK and Europe prices creep up, but also the general interest in it. Yeah. You know the Elise S ones you know they've probably doubled in price in the last eighteen months. Esprits, you know, you won't find an Esprit under thirty thousand pounds now. I smile every time I see an Esprit on the road. Yeah, they are really, really cool to see. Yeah, I've got an orange one. Do you? Yeah, got what cr- generation? It's the GT3, so ninety eight. Oh, that's so, like pretty much the end, right? Yeah, it's sort of back to basics, two liter, mm-hmm. you know, no wings, narrow tires. So no, they're amazing. Great designers working on that one as well. Was there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did that. Do you? You did that one, right? I did that one with Jilin, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The one we have here is so cool. The three fifty. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. It makes the greatest sounds when it when it when we start it up because we have to warm it up once a month as part of our part of our deal. Yeah. It is it is a really really yeah. neat car. You should tell me it needs to deglaze the bra- brakes every now and again as well. Take we really break. should, but uh, you know <laughs> we offer that here. Keep those we tires offer round. we offer vehicle exercise. Well, we 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 shuffle them around so the tires don't get flat spotted. Is this the public broadcast part? Is yeah, it? <laughs> yeah, it's part of our thing. But uh, no, they we have on our list of services here vehicle exercise. How many people have taken me up on it? This many. Yeah. zero people have been like, yes, Matt, I'd like to pay you to drive my car around. <laughs> I keep waiting for that old Mercedes for someone to ask me to do it. <laughs> right. Mm. But no. Um, but, uh, yeah, what is a uh, – since you guys have all been there for, for quite some time, what is what is your favorite historical Lotus? Uh, I like the Elise. You know, I think I think what the Elise was about and what it achieved um, is a bit different now. Um I, I'm actually getting a final edition, so I'm the last one to the Lotus Owners Club on <laughs> on this table. Um, but I'm getting a final edition one because you'd, you'd just have to have it. I think um, this is the one that you're you just stop selling or about yeah. to stop selling. Yeah, we stop making it next month as well. Oh. So that's it. So it's got a, it's got the six in it, right? Uh, no, that's the Exige. Oh, that's just the Exige. Yeah. The Elise still has the four. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, for me, I think I think it's the Elise. I think it's. Um, yeah, it was, it was just such a pure car. The S ones, you know, the S ones are just brilliant, really, and um, so much fun to drive. Oh, I got to, I got to drive Gavs actually at Goodwood, so uh, that that was quite nice driving up the hill. And um, but yeah, I think yeah, for me it's the Elise. What about you, Rose? I I always give a different answer every time someone asks me. So uh, if anyone checks, it, it won't align. But I think I think I really like the Esprit. I think that's still a really important one because. You know, growing up in the 70s, that was the car. You know, the Formula One team was the Formula One team, and then the S1 Esprit. I think that's one of my favourite. But uh, um, there's so many I like. I like the original Elite, you know, from the late 50s. I think that's a really pretty car. They are, those are nice. Yeah, yeah. and uh, some of the – we use some of the sports prototypes as sort of references. So the Type 30, Type 40 race cars from the, the 60s, which weren't necessarily great racing cars in the day, but – just beautiful shapes on the car and we use those as a little bit of an impetus to to what we do design wise but mm. uh, yeah and i i drive an exit my car is an exige i've got a 2016 exige so oh that's, that's all right cool car. yeah what about you yeah oh i can't decide i've got an elise <laughs> and a, a spree and a navora oh you got oh nice so they will just own such a bit of you know memories of when you're working on them but now as well you respect when you get to drive the old cars as well you know you drive an elite or a, you know Clive Chapman's got an 11 
and they're just amazing pieces of history. So I always, I can brag, because I've driven some of the Formula 1 cars and the 72, I've driven Emerson 72, so that, I always just default to that one. I had the little... Is that as terrifying as it looks? It's amazing. It's so forgiving. Obviously, I was very slow in it, but it's really forgiving compared with the sort of more modern cars that you embrace it. Obviously, you forget about safety in it. But I think I'm nearly 50 now. It was part of your life growing up, seeing it on telly. Every Corgi toy was a 72. Yeah. Coolest racing drivers driving them. So I always default to that. That's my favorite Lotus, really. Yeah. It, and compared you, with the Navai, you know, they always get better, don't they? Yeah. So you have to go back to sort of the emotional side of it. Sure. Did you all, see? all my cars are old poster cars. I don't, I don't have any. It was Gav driving the 72 for the launch of the Amira. I was Amira. just about to say yeah. that. Did you manage to see the video oh. of that at all? Oh, was that? Oh, was that to you? Torrential right. rain. Torrential rain. And Gav sat there in the 72, but you still gave it some, didn't you? Man, Gav? that is a cool looking race car. Yeah, and you know, the, I just one of my mentors was a guy called John Miles. He was the, he actually drove that. He was Rint's teammate. Uh huh. So having the guy train me as an engineer. And he'd tell you tales over coffee about when they took the anti-dive off it at a certain circuit and they found it, you know, and it wasn't a great race car when it was first built. So there's an emotional attachment there. And we're really lucky that just opposite our factory, Clive Chapman has his collection and there's virtually one of every Lotus racing car. So we often take guests around there. So you just see yourself dribbling in the corner next to a Type 25 Clark car or Damon Hill's seven or Clark's. Um, Forty nine things like this. So, Do the, are those cars running? Are they yeah, ready? They're yeah. ready to ready yeah, to take out and drive. Yeah. And they run them on a track quite often mm. as well. So that that gets the biggest attention whenever you hear the F one cars starting up on there. It's kind of like the people just appear yeah. right inside the track. It's so, nice to have your own track. Yeah, that helps. And I think it's where Goodwood helps as well because yeah. we're always aware. You know, the month leading up to Goodwood, Clive's team will just bring more and more and more <laughs> cars over so we isn't we're normally celebrating some anniversary of you know x amount of wins or first win right so there's always a formula one car going around the track or like russell says an x you know le mans from the 50s and things like this car going around that's super cool yeah when i uh russ when i when i um spoke with ian callum mm-hmm. who was a very nice guy yeah he is yeah. he's he said he's never owned any of the cars that he's designed because mm-hmm. the production cars were compromised for one reason or another versus his from his pure design um do you feel that way about cars you've designed or or do you well we're always dissatisfied that's the whole <laughs> yeah. that's the whole point of what we do <laughs> if we thought it's perfect now there'd be nothing to give so right. well matt will know he has to sort of put a crook around our neck and stop us working at some point because mm-hmm. we will go on and on wanting to improve the design of the car. But uh, no, I'm, I'm not equally. I'm very happy to be driving around in an Exige, which is one of the cars that I worked on. You know, it's uh, it's such a sort of visceral, exciting car, even though on the scale of ability of driving and he'll bear this up. I'm about here compared to Gavin, but I get a thrill out of driving it, you know, at 30, 40 miles an hour, just hearing the sound of it. And uh, it's obviously quite nice if people stop you and say, this is a really cool looking car. Yeah. So yeah. You're, are you able to walk outside and see that car and go, you know, you're, you're just happy to see it. You like what was done and you don't look at all the flaws and the things that engineering I see, took out of it. Well, well, I see the flaws that sometimes we missed as well, mm. not just engineering, but you know, you have to look past those. But I'm, I'm sure it's the same in any creative, you know, industry. I'm sure there's loads of musicians who sort of go. I'm sure Paul McCartney sits back, doesn't he, and says, yeah. no, "Not I'm comparing himself to Paul McCartney, but sits back and you? Um, you know, <laughs> listens to Sergeant Pepper and goes, oh, that's not so good, really. I, <laughs> yeah. could, I could have done better on that one.' He, yeah, yeah. he also blames engineering. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. What about uh, what was the race car that you guys sold I don't know seven eight years ago that was not quite a Formula One car T125 T125 it was like a customer Formula One car basically yeah it's awesome yeah Um, it sort of got his most fame when Jeremy Clarkson had to fit in it in Top Gear right right Um, that's that's, that's pretty much where I saw it and and, uh, one of the Private uh, race tracks uh, that uh, I'm, not, I'm not a member of, but I'm associated with, just got one. Yeah, I think Monticello in New yep. York just got one. Yeah, I think Christian Zugel had one. Yeah, 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 and yeah, there it is. Yeah, and I mean, this is a this is a pretty insane project uh, to 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 sell something like this to people. Did you actually have some takers for this thing? Yeah, we sold ten. <laughs> I've got a customer in Bahrain. He's got two. 
Um, it's an amazing story that he saw Top Gear, rang us up, said, is it real? I said, yes, I'll have it. Um, that sounds very Bahraini. Never, never perfect. came over. We delivered the car to him. I went with the car, um, said, you know, start asking him about his racing pedigree. So I've never driven around Bahrain before. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we actually said, can um, we start you in an Elise? Can no, we he actually bonus Elise for this. Yeah, it was something like that. They they were hiring radicals. So he said, should we hire a radical? And he said, um, if I wanted a radical, I'd have bought one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it. It was a. Uh, I think it was early to the club, wasn't it? If you look what McLaren had done with their GT clubs and yeah. FXXK and things like this, we were doing the same. It was to give the ultimate experience as a customer, the Formula One experience, training, um, and it was really usable. It only revved to ten thousand. It was still the best part of seven hundred <laughs> horsepower and six hundred kilos. Um, full carbon brakes. I mean, it seemed like Jeremy Clarkson struggled a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> with it. It, didn't see, it didn't seem like, let's say, easy. It, it seemed challenging. It's fast. You know, it is fast. It, um, uh, <laughs> you wouldn't know by looking at it. I mean, it's just, uh, <laughs> it, what's funny is like the, the FXX or FXK is like they still look like a car. Yeah, know? yeah, it's a, and that's this a production like base F one car. car. Yeah, this is a, this is a Formula One. It was designed car as a Formula One car. It's meant to be faster than a GP two car. Um, and when Roman Grosjean was testing it, when he was a Lotus driver, he'd have actually qualified it on the grid if we'd have took his lap time. The, <laughs> in an F1 race? Yeah, in the F1 race. Really? That was when the grid was a little bit more separated with, you know, it was when we with had... With Marussias. Well, I think and we whatever. had four Lotuses on there at one point, didn't we? Yeah. we had, so Great. that was the performance of it. And at that point, people thought we were crazy because it was a million. And now we're talking about two million, you know, yeah, as a street yeah. car, things like this. So, Well, now I think there's probably... I bet I bet there's at least if I sat down and thought about it I bet there's at least 10 cars you could buy right now for more than 2 million dollars yeah. production yeah. road cars. Yeah and you know our customers who bought that actually said I don't want to take my road car on the track it may be super fast it's not designed for that it's probably yeah. you know that can be safer I can it's designed for it it's got big slicks so that was the the idea behind it and you know we've always embraced motor racing and you know the Amira we're now doing a GT4 car so you'll probably see that racing in America in not so long so r- motor racing is in our blood did any did any customer who bought one of these were they ever able to drive it anywhere near what it could actually do uh, <laughs> we've had yeah we did have some customers who uh, they a lot of them had monoposto uh-huh. F1 cars which are really expensive to run per mile so they'd go out and test in that, get used to a track, get their eye back in, because literally five laps in that, you know, you're trying to pin your head off. Um, so, and then they'd jump in there, whatever car they owned. And, historic Formula yes, One historic car. historic Formula and... One. So it was great, and you meet some great customers, you know. Well, you've um, got to be out of your Roger mind. Roger Daltrey to buy drove it out of the Who. Did he really? Yeah, he popped up a Hethel and had a quick lap round in it. So, right. so that's cool. how usable it was. I mean, it looks amazing. And obviously, if you, if you one, have the money, and you, two, have either the interest and hopefully the driving chops, like, why not, if you have the means, why not level up your driving as high as you can and then get to that point? That'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, if I wanted to drive on a racetrack, I'd buy a fucking race car. I, you know what I mean? I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be taking my street cars around the racetrack if I had that kind of money. And I think that's the philosophy, you know, some of the customers and people are buying GT4 cars as nearly track day toys. Yeah. You know, they're not horrendous price in what you can do with them. You're safe and they're designed to do, you know, 24 hours of pounding around a circuit. Do they have any? Do they have uh, track clubs in the UK yet? They have lots of track days, but not like the sort of we call them golf not clubs. Like, well, yeah, yeah sort of, you know, that's the new hot shit stuff. here. Yeah, Thermal, so. Monticello, and Autobahn. They're, I mean, they're really cool. Have you guys been around to them? I've done like um, one or two. I remember you took our Avora four hundred to some, didn't you? I think. Uh, what uh, did I go to? Uh, I took them to private private days. Did I go to any? Cl- you, you went to Button Willow, Willow Springs, Button and Willow. those are just local oh, tracks. Right. But Thermal in Palm Springs is is like the real hoity toity right. one with the five star restaurant, and it's like millions of dollars to get in. It's pretty awesome. We'll have to go around and embarrass it's, a few people. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. The track is the track itself is very nice. Actually, an Avora GT is about the right size, weight, power yep. for that track. Anything faster than that, and the track gets pretty small pretty quick. Uh, like a 400 horsepower car yep. is just about right for that track. But to get in, you have to buy a property, okay, and then you have to put a, ho- a home on it. 
Okay. You can't just sit on the dirt. You have to build, actually build a home. And uh, they have probably the best racetrack food I've ever had. Well, that Google, that is old ass Google Maps. But so you've got a North Circuit, you've got a South Circuit, and then you can combine them uh, into two. But that looks like this is very old because there's a loop up that goes up to the north where you can see they're starting to. This has got to be at least two or three years old because there's another loop that goes up there. So this was purpose built for this purpose. It wasn't another Hunt, race trip. No, practical. built in the middle of the cornfields for that. And then Monticello is probably the nicest one north of New York. That's like the circuit is like VIR. It's I suppose incredible. In Europe, Ascari Race Resort was the closest. Oh yeah, Ascari. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That one's very pretty. Yeah. So. Yeah. And they they're really useful for car launches and stuff like that as well because they're catered for nice food and hotels, mm-hmm. as you said. So. I'm surprised the UK hasn't had come up with one of those yet. No. Uh, Jonathan Palmer owns most of the circuits. The ex Formula One driver in England, and he's done a real amount for motorsport. Now you can take your kids there. The food's good. The restrooms are clean. Yeah. And kids are free. So I think that's been the big change in motorsport in the UK. That's good. Yeah. That's awesome. Can so I, what? Yeah. Go ahead. Can I ask Gavin what your driving education was like i mean you know you started at lotus when you were whatever 16 <laughs> yeah and now you're you know teaching people how to drive near f1 cars and such um i grew up with go-karts um so probably eight years old but before that i think my dad took an old austin a45 off a child's carousel and, and put a little engine in it so i was driving around probably before i was still in nappies type thing um Race go-karts, um, never had big budgets, but then we got into um, oval racing in the UK. So it's a bit like sprint cars, but it's full contact here. So they're... <laughs> so they're t- <laughs> like, like, really? Yeah, stock cars. So they've got the big wing on the top, rail cars, and you can hit each other as hard as you want. And they're, they're some of them are small block, um, so 400 horsepower. Holy shit. Oh, wow, that's probably intense. Um, and it's wow. on either tarmac or shale. And the fastest guy starts at the very back. Oh, they reverse grid. So every race is reversed, (laughs) apart from the big cash finals, where if you're the top of the points, you start at the front. But then that's not the best place to start sometimes either. So (laughs) learning the world is just coming at you from behind. Yeah. Yeah. So learning sort of car control, close contact racing, and I think it was just the volume of racing that you were racing three times a week. Um, so it wasn't this huge event where you've been prepping for it for two months and saving up. It was like you race on Wednesday, you race on Saturday, you race on sort of Monday night. So that was that. And then I got into circuit racing in a Lotus. I just bought a little ex-development car and met a, a young guy who was struggling. I set his car up and his dad was, um, let's say, quite wealthy. And he said, right, we're going... And G- that was Michael Schumacher. <laughs> 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 we're going GT racing, and I've raced, you know, British GT, Le Mans series and stuff like that um, ever since, really. And it's probably some of the other stuff is... He's being modest. He's done more than just yeah. race. That, <laughs> you know, I raced a Mosler, a oh, Celine, those, are, those um, are wild. Things like this. And then some of the most enjoyable is racing stuff for Clive Chapman. So X, you know... Like we said, Le Mans type 30s and 40s. And Vintage this, racing uh, stuff? Yeah, so generally sit in anything and have a go in it and just enjoy it, really. You know, the, I think young racing drivers now are under so much pressure. There's so much budget involved. There's so much, you know, they only race six or eight times a year. They can't enjoy it. So, you know, I think guys in America, some of the best racing is sort of oval racing and sprint stuff. Oh, man, and, the yeah. sprint stuff is crazy. And it's not huge budget. You learn a lot. You're working on the car in a dusty pit changing the diff axle you know things like this and it's working out what stagger does and that was the funniest thing at john miles the ex-formula one driver who's quite posh wasn't he Russ? Mm-hmm. he actually come to uh, oval race with me and he couldn't understand why we needed so much camber compared to you know what a road car runs so it's it's opening you know and they're all live axle as well so you are they single speed as well no uh, you have the gearbox between your legs <sighs> That's and so then you shady. shift gears. So you used to take second gears out of as many different Ford products as you could because they were all slightly different. So your your second would be very similar to your third and your fourth. But if you got out in the lead, you could shift into third gear or fourth gear, which was just a high second and so, so on. So you literally, your gearbox would just be multiple second gears yeah, multiple from second different... Gears. <laughs> and then you've got a foot either, side of, foot either side of the bell housing. So you'd left foot brake and things like this. So no, yeah. it's just, I think that's just that. And, you know, some of the... 
Derek Warwick and things like that who've raced in Formula One car came from those. Um, so no, it's a good grounding and it's it's great just to get your car knowledge up again. That's cool. Do you guys have? Do you guys get into racing much or not really? Who me? Yeah, oh, either I, of you. I've never done racing. No, I'm not, I realise where my talents lie when I see people like Gavin. So, uh, but no desire. I've got desire, but I've got a reality check that I'm, <laughs> I'm going to embarrass myself by not being very good. I've done track days and done things like that and driving courses. So, you know, I, I enjoy it, but I know I'm not really good at it. So, uh, If you're high up enough at the company, are you allowed to just play with your own car at Hethel if you sign the waiver? Is that allowed? Well, if you're MD, you can drive anything, <laughs> yeah. uh, as we've heard. So, uh, yeah, I haven't got any racing background, but I have just done my racing license. So I'm not sure how we're going to use that yet. But uh, quite funny, Gav was trying to teach me how to drift in a mirror on track the other day so there's not many people have driven it and uh, we were out there having a bit of a play so it well, seems like good access it's right? very modest. modest we followed him through the canyons and Russ and I go how are you going to explain oh, yeah. that the MD's <laughs> gone up the side because oh, <laughs> no. I was struggling to be honest you know so you got good roads here yeah brilliant roads yeah. you know and like you said but it was all within the speed limit wasn't it Gary? it was all within the speed limit <laughs> no so as I said Matt's spending some time out on the track with us both and it's enjoyable because the stuff that if we want to make things better that need time, extra time on the project or investment or mm -hmm. it's not just a PowerPoint presentation, I can go, well, Matt's driven it. He's seen it. He's not happy either. And yeah. so I, I, use I it can actually my... drive it and give yeah. some reasonable feedback, can't yeah, I? It's so really it's, uh, yeah, so it kind of happens then, doesn't it? <laughs> he gave me a car at the weekend, which I think it was a bit of a setup because it needed, it needed some modifications. I got out of it and went, this is crap. <laughs> and how, went, much, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> how much of your setup comes from what happens to the car beyond the limit you know what i mean like yeah okay you're great you, you know okay this car drifts really well but here's this other car that's great at eight tenths but once you start really getting it loose it sort of falls apart how how important is it that it's that it's perfect beyond the limit what we'd say is that we want a car that probably 75 percent of their owners can take to the limit and realize they're getting close to the limit and it's absolutely flatters them it gives them a high degree of confidence they're not all arms and legs trying to slay and you'll never see like strange larry modes in our cars so our esc is there in the first mode to protect you in the wet weather horrible conditions and then we're one of the only manufacturers that go fully off as well so our abs is always absolutely tip top and what we call it is sliding grip so if you go over the limit it's like a Lotus Cortina. You know you're at the limit. You can push it over, and then if you're absolutely larry and hurl it in, then yeah, physics and things like this. But it wants to be enjoyable that, and it wants to reward people to go at it. But actually, once you've messed about with it, we all like drifting the same as wheelies and things like this. But the enjoyment is coming back and going. I want to be more accurate. I'm going to get that apex. I'm going to just run that curb. Mm. So that becomes the enjoyment thing. But no, you have to sign off cars that are safe. You know that. People are distracted on the road, you know, things like this. You see a slip road just at the last minute and you do a big steer input. You don't want a drifty car at that point, do you? When you've just been dropped off at the airport. <laughs> so, you know, there's a time and a place and that's hence why our, you know, our ultimate mode allows you to do that. That's good. Yeah. I like a car you can slide. I'll take I'll take that. You can I just get can I just have you set it up in like it, just the experts only mode, maybe? It, yeah, that's th but you can take you know, not to encourage your listeners to do things. <laughs> but you can take virtually any car and, you know, if we get, not to get too technical, put toe out on the rear axle. Yeah. It will drift. Yeah. You know, so you can convert a good car into a bad one and you can make a bad one quite a good one, hence why Lotus Engineering exists. So a lot of it is just people don't spend enough time on doing their geometries and tyre pressures and putting decent tyres in it. Or if they're going to mess about drifting, don't buy decent tyres in the rear, you know. <laughs> buy rubbish tyres and it'll yeah, drift yeah. easier. We've learned, we've learned that. Yeah, 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 so I think... 60 PSI and some yeah, really terrible tyres. Yeah, some of the, you know, if we do marketing campaigns, you'll stick the four bar in the back and it'll drift quite nicely. <laughs> so, yeah, there's always a way, but obviously when you're hoping to sell you know five six thousand cars a year of sports cars you don't want every um person who owns it you know you, you wouldn't you'd never be in front of an amir would you you wouldn't trust it so but that's that's the thing that at least six age avoras everything else avaya you'll see the avaya images it's still sideways with lots of smoke pouring out of the rear which people didn't think you'd ever be able to do with an electric sports car so you can tune the cars how you want them did you see the, the images of the uh, Gav driving the uh, 
Evire at Goodwood with all the smoke coming off. I did not. Yeah. I bet I'm sure Zach can find that. The the interesting thing to me about the oh here, <laughs> the interesting thing about the uh, the electric cars when they start to get really fast is that without engine noise and without uh, a gear to select, it becomes quite challenging to manage your. Oh, there you go. That is lit up. To manage your corner entry speed, you have to actually pay it. You could enter a corner 40, 50 miles an hour too hot, couldn't you? Yeah, and that's one thing that some of the current electric cars don't have good enough brakes for the performance. You know, like you said before, they're, they're known as dragsters. Yeah, yeah. But you can carry so much more speed into a corner, and it's accelerated to that speed much quicker. Yeah. So when you exit that corner, you've got to the next one even quicker. So, yeah, there's a – and things like regen – Often the electric brake cars don't have what they have called decoupled brakes. So it's like drive by wire, it's linear brake by wire. Yeah. So the brake pedal is just a computer algorithm going, you could have this much effort, but you actually want to press more. So, yeah, there's lots of work to be done then. And that's where, you know, again, it's lessons learned for us because you want perfect brake feel, not just a, you know, a simulator in effect. Yeah. So now I think that whole thing about the performance of electric vehicles impacts every single part of it and you know one pedal driving now people absolutely love it and some people hate it you know where you lift off and it virtually throws you through the windshield i like it in the city yeah i do i do enjoy it in in the city it's a relaxing way to drive but when i get up like uh in in the more you know canyon type of situations which is not why i would buy an electric car for that but maybe if it was Two million dollars would be a different story, but but I, I then I then I like it less and less the faster I'm you know going. And I think that's what we're when we talk about even ADAS systems and things like this, the systems are actually quite good if they're tuned well yeah. and in the right environment. You know, if you've got a really busy freeway and you can just lock it in radar cruise and it'll just sit there and you know the wipers are going. But like you say, in the canyon and it's yeah, accelerate when you don't want to. So there's a time and a place for everything and, yeah. and all technologies. My friend just sent me this. This is from this month's DuPont registry. Someone is advertising uh, an, an Amira for sale right now <laughs> with 20, mile, 20 miles on it. So does that car exist? <laughs> there's, some, there's something you haven't been told, obviously. <laughs> Someone has stolen <laughs> one. There's currently one car in America, and it's grey. So, it's uh, not, and this one's blue. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, that uh, looks like, very much like a picture of our uh, show car. Perhaps we should this buy one it has so a, we pick this, up tomorrow. Now, it says, <laughs> this one's a very, very odd. It says, now taking orders, only 20 miles. So are we taking orders or do we have one? Yeah. And then it has a stock number. Stock number L E M I R A double zero. So my advice is, <laughs> do not pay any money to that person for that car because it's not there. It's not, I really wish it was, uh, but it's, it's not, not there. real. <laughs> so, yeah, disappointments. But, so when are we going to get Amira? Uh, later next year. Okay. Yeah, Corey so. said I can come to Hethel and drive it in the springtime. Does that sound right? Yes, you can. We're okay. going to be doing. Um, yeah. We'll be doing the driving events through March and April, I think, yeah. probably April. So. I can't wait. And, and we've spent we've spent a fortune on the factory as well. So is it a new factory? Yeah, you've been oh. to Heffel before. No, never. No. So we've spent a hundred million in the last two years on the factory. Built a factory for Avaya, factory for Amira, a new factory where we're building the chassis uh, close to Norwich Airport as well. Um, staff facilities. We've got a fantastic uh, canteen now, or sweet restaurant and stuff. And so the place is transformed, but it needs to be because. We want we want the quality. We want the people really enthusiastic about building the best cars they can. Amira, as we said, will be so accomplished. It's got we've got automated painting, we've got semi-automated manufacturing, we've got new quality fixtures, new quality. Were the cars hand painted before? Yeah, I really? Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, How about that. So, it's, Are there, is there still an apprentice program for people? Yes, there is. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They uh, so yeah, the apprentices. I don't know how many we did this year actually, but me eight or ten I think yeah. so but they go around they you know in power train and um, see see all the workings and then work out where they want to go and I mean I see that's cool that's how you end up at the top yes <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's, it's how I ended up at the top but I, I mean, mean it's uh, uh, it seems like a, like if you're really enthusiastic about it and you you know it seems like there's an opportunity for a lifetime career in that program huh yeah I mean it's doable I mean Gav and I are examples of it it's senior people in the company um, and the thing I, I like about it as well is you get um, 
you get a lot of respect from people in production as well and operations because they know you've been through it. So it's you know it's not some um, stuffy graduate who's just come out of university that's trying to tell them what to do. They they do appreciate it. And but you know the level of conversation maybe is is, is not broadcastable <laughs> on here. So I, I always say when, when they start calling you some really bad names on the production line, you know they like you. So you've kind of been you've kind of been accepted then sort of nice. thing. So it's uh, but no, they're a great bunch. I mean we got such a wonderful team there everybody's really pulling in the same direction and it's it's been transformed isn't it it's just people come to work with a smile on their face so it's 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 wonderful it seems like a fun place to to work i mean you don't have to build any crossovers you know (laughs) it's the best job i've had it's nice (laughs) it's nice well thank you guys for sharing your time with us i appreciate it i hope you enjoyed our uh, our roads nice oh wait we we had some good questions oh we we have questions for people yeah if we can do them quick oh yeah sure you guys have a few minutes Yeah. yeah all right cool uh let's see joe leonard says these questions are all from our patreon if you want to ask questions of our guests you must be a patron that's at patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast you know the drill by now joe leonard says how many years of wait what how many years of consecutive models will it take to exhaust all engine placement locations in ev supercars what does that mean I think if we shorten the question, just how many different combinations or places do engineers or designers think they could put a motor? Like, you know, well, we have... Well, mo- where are the motors? At the axles, right? Aren't the motors yeah. on the... Aren't it's the motors the way you place yeah, the you battery. It's more about the... Ba- I think the batteries yeah. is more about it, right? Some, you know, some car- electric cars are converted through hub motors and things mm-hmm. like this, so they, they do it. Um, obviously, you can see some of the classic cars that have in e-motors fitted. So, you know, for us... It's about what power you want the model to have. You know, there's natural limitations by the motors and cost and complexity. If it's two-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, things like this. But the the main thing is, if you tune it well, it's the ultimate differential as well. That you know, the Avaya being a motor on each each wheel is the most intelligent differential. You can do it. You could literally want it to do a one-sided burnout, a front-wheel drive burnout, one yeah. wheel, or a tank turn. So that, and I think you know, if reading into the question a little bit is you know we've you know matt's gone into the press saying that the uh, amira is our last petrol engine car so we better get there quite quickly <laughs> yeah seriously what well, uh, i was at the sema show this year and one of the th- one of the themes was ev swapped muscle cars mm-hmm. and classic trucks i mean that seems to be like the thing that everyone is latched onto now and they're t- they're putting battery packs where engines were that's pretty much our health and safety got- team would love to see that yeah, you've got an ev 150 haven't you so an F one fifty. The new, the yeah. new one from, I mean, from Ford yeah. is uh, is uh, electric, yeah. And they've got the the frunk uh, that is like enormous. Mm-hmm. That has a that has a skateboard battery, mm-hmm. um, and I like that one because it's just it's just a truck. You know, it's not trying to be like a mm-hmm. fucking Total Recall movie prop or something. It's just <laughs> it's just a truck that happens to be electric. That is a sign of change, though, isn't it? I think. Yeah, I mean, I hope the infrastructure catches up to this product yeah. because if if there's not not everybody can charge at their home or their office easily um the people will still need to rely on public charging but it's nice to see that the it's not only these sort of concepty cars that are going to be electric it's because they're like they're pretty cool i mean it's not they're nice to drive in in everyday mm-hmm. situations yeah. they yeah. announced in the uk this week or last week that um they're going to legislate that all new houses have to have charging points fixed. oh really yeah see that that is probably good I think and apartment apartment buildings more yeah. importantly yeah. they're going to have to make the landlords put them in because there's a lot of folks who live in apartment buildings and the landlords are just like no <laughs> not putting that in you know but they, they need the system you got on the ramps here so yes. you can go up to their windows you exactly know, so exactly <laughs> <laughs> uh dante casali wants to know about tires uh when choosing tires for cars at lotus do the construction specs of the tire play a large part in the decision making or is it mostly driving performance based Second part, can consumers get value out of manufacturers' published technical information regarding tires or are reviews a better gauge of ride handling performance? Okay, the first one, tires open up the whole key to development. So, A, 
if a man if you can't get a certain tire size that you want in your car if you can persuade the manufacturer we were famous for putting a 175 width tire in the front of an elise it looked like a ducati rear <laughs> but it's what gave <laughs> or the elise. bmw i3 right with its little like bicycle front tire yeah so size is you know if you if you don't have to stick to standard sizes is amazing but then if you're in a size where you have the ability to tune the construction and compound it's amazing because typically the tires the bulk tires um, will be tuned to a volume model so often it's porsches mercedes bmw things like this and if your weight distribution and how you want the car to steer and feel doesn't correlate to that then you have to change the suspension to get that back where mm -hmm. with goodyear and michelin on the amira we have bespoke tires compound and construction but to put that into perspective Emira, which had a effectively a tire, the Eagle F1 system, which has already been in production. It was on Porsches, BMWs, things like this. We still tried 70 different front constructions and compounds and 80 rears to get wow. the tire construction and compound we wanted. And that's because of high speed stability, braking, wet grip high grip performance and then so the before way you go out and just change the tires on your sports car to something else consider consider what they went through yeah. to come up with that tire and hence why you know the big brands if you're really sensitive to it you put lts for lotus on the sidewall or porsche put their mark on the side mm -hmm. so the recommendation is to do that don't just throw them away you know and put the cheapest on um and then does the consumer get value yes the unfortunately the sort of wet performance and efficiency they're so grouped but typically look at the reviews it's probably worth following a, a journalist or somebody who reviews tires who knows what they're doing and unfortunately it's one of those things where if you buy cheap you're buying not the chemicals in them the chemicals in tires are expensive the silica and things like this so something that's going to cost you 50 bucks isn't going to have much technical chemical in the tire mm -hmm. where something that's you know 200 bucks is going to be the right thing so yeah recommendation is buy the one for your car or you know look at it you know the ps4 michelins and things like this are always great tires typically off the shelf they'll work with your tire but yeah, you know there's more and more data around and you know if it's a lotus customer just send us a quick send us what you want and we'll try and feed you back it's hard for people like us to give tire advice because we're you know we drive press cars and they've they've got tires on it yeah. and it's not like i don't mm -hmm. i don't get to take one car to the to the track and you know whatever when i drove your uh avora uh 400 i i had it for a month and I did three track days on the standard tire, and then I swapped out for a Cup 2. And I liked the standard tire a lot better. Yeah, you know, they're designed to give a big wide breadth of performance, yeah. aren't they, from cold weather to, you know, we didn't know it's the canyon here. You know, you start at, you know, 80 degrees at the bottom, and you're, yeah. uh, you know, in the low 40s at the top. Yeah, and a 5,000 foot, foot spread. Yeah, yeah. You know, so big difference. The tire's going through a real change in character. And there, there. could be gravel on the, on the road. Yeah. And, yeah. and then, you know, the recommendation is always keep the pressures right and spend 100 bucks now and again and get the geometry set. And yeah. it's better value. Yeah, yeah. You can um, see why this guy's the first guy we always have to talk to when we yeah. design a new car. Because, yeah. of course, we always want to do big wheels. Of course. Uh, and there's not always the right tyre to go yeah. with those. So <laughs> yeah. we, we have to we have to get to a compromise on that. 22's on mm. everything, baby. At least. <laughs> <laughs> he just rolls his eyes sometimes. Uh, Vlad wants to know, how different are the right-hand drive and left-hand drive versions of a car? And how much engineering goes into those differences? Oh, so, interesting question. Um, well, the difference between the cars is, is not a lot. And the, re the reason for that is to try and keep the cost down. Mm -hmm. Because what we will try and do, and, and in clever design, you'll have the minimal bits of parts that are actually handed because you have to tool them twice. So, you know, it's really expensive to do. So you'll see a lot of cars where they look identical depending on what side they are. But we put a lot of development into left-hand drive cars as well. So half our fleet that we've built for a mirror mm -hmm. so far, we've probably done... 50 cars yeah they're left hand drive so i was driving a left hand drive in the uk last week so uh that's was, fun yeah it's good fun it's and good fun the previous chassis as well the least exceeding of aura are not right or left hand drive and the chassis mm -hmm. born when it gets a vin and the one side of the steering column is blanked out that's when it becomes the hand drive 
the only thing we watch is obviously tune in engine mounts and things mm-hmm. like this because often you're just trying to balance the weight across the en- the cockpit so you don't feel more bounce in one side than the other but no we don't have special dampers right to left and things like that it's i, I suppose we used to think a lot about footwell didn't we and yeah. clutch rest and things but obviously yeah. that's something that's disappearing as we move towards evs and yeah. dct but yeah Sometimes I was proud that Mercedes comp- has real disdain for having to build right-hand drive cars. Their <laughs> pedal boxes are shit in the right-hand drive cars, but they're always very comfortable on the left. The Germans are, like, not into building right-hand drive cars. They don't give a fuck. <laughs> That's good to know, though, that there's not actually all, all that much differences. Um, Ben Stahl, uh, can you go into detail on what the difference are between sport and touring suspension for the upcoming Amira? You've not been asked this at all before, Gary. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm sympathetic of the guys who are on their configurators because they're putting their deposit down and they're trying to order specs. So, yeah, the the tour is, as we said, designed for people who do probably 90% of their ownership on highways and things like this. Um or are coming from a sports car that's a little bit more refined, things like this, so they're new to the brand. And it will come with the Goodyear tyre on it as standard, so wet weather, all the rest of it. But it is not soft. You can drive it in the canyon. I can guarantee you're not going to feel body roll, things like this. It's just when you're... So it's got slightly less road noise, things like this, hub control. And the good thing is that the ride heights, things like this, so the car physically doesn't sit any different tour and sport. So the Sport gets the slightly different valve code inside, so the washers inside the damper, being simple, are different. The forces, how it builds up in the damper and the spring rate. That's the only difference. We're trying to keep it sensible like that. Um, And that comes with a good year, but also it's tuned for the Cup 2 tyre. So if people are, you know, weekend drivers or they drive enthusiastically, perhaps they're coming from a supercar back into sports cars, or they're used to a quite a firm Exige or something like this, that it's the car that suits them as well. So you're not getting shortchanged on any other part of the car by not having the sport. That was a conscious decision that you don't have to tick the stiffer suspension to get a different star or a splitter or a spoiler, something like that, so the yeah. car's the same. Good tip. I would probably go Tour. I like, I like some Give. Yeah, a little bit given, as you said, you know, the... the I don't like to buy tires every 2,000 miles. No, and the tires are really good. And, you know, <laughs> here, freeway hops are a real issue as well as... Oh, some yeah. Broken Do surfaces. you have a replica of the 405? I suggest you build a replica of Luckily, the 405. Luckily, the main road out of Norwich to <laughs> London, they've never repaired, apart oh, from really bad concrete patches. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got something similar to Detroit in the 405 perfect. now. Perfect, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Jonathan K. Oh, thoughts on the... G- Cayman GT4 RS. Uh, if the GT4 is marginal, uh, for too stiff for street use, I don't think that. The GT4 RS would be serious overkill. All Porsche RS cars are brutally stiff on the street. I wouldn't comment on the people's cars. You know, they, they've got their DNA. They know no. what they want. Porsche, I will. It's going to be brutally but stiff. But Porsche have a staircase up to the RS, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So if that's too stiff for you, come back one notch, things There's like that. There's seven Caymans below the RS. So that, that's to. their thing. Yeah. We admire them because it keeps us honest. It keeps us honest with the materials that you use, the amount of carbon fiber. keeps Russell's team with wings and splitters and things like this. So... And it allows people to, you know, stay in sports because they don't have to jump into the supercar market to have different performance. So you have to admire them, you know, and all the other manufacturers that are doing it as well. Actually, when I had uh, your uh, Avora GT press car, I went for a drive with a friend of mine that had a Cayman GT4. And I actually, um, I thought I found them to be very comparable. Uh, they both had similar power. They both have had kind of long gearing. Yeah. Um, I actually thought the Evora was nicer to use every day. It was easier to get in and out of compared to the Porsche bucket yeah. seats. Um, Porsche had a little bit better materials. Um, no, our but, recommendation is if you haven't, if people haven't driven a Lotus and they're only Cayman owners give us a chance you'd probably if you've driven a Cayman GT4 you'd probably like the Avora GT yeah, and a lot yeah that's the thing we've yeah. got to learn you know we shouldn't criticise Porsche or say oh we're better than this better than that I was we're, faster on the track we're on the shopping list now so <laughs> come and come and explore us you know drive yeah. an Avora now and just realise that perhaps the things that you think well I won't buy it because of this is now fixed the Avora is really good for tall people 
It's is yes, a it's really a, good tall people sports car. Yeah, it's a, it's a little. The mirror is even so. better because we worked on ingress, egress, and stuff like that. As is it well. still a two plus two? No, two seater, pure two seater. Pure two seater. But you got space behind you for a, a couple of cabin bags or a suitcase or whatever. Kristen Lee uh, from The Drive had uh, an Avora GT press car. And the, I guess the one that I drove did not have the optional rear seat. It just had the shelf. Or mm-hmm. did it? It did have it. No, you said my, I, yours mine didn't had the have shelf. a seat. Hers had a seat. Hers had a seat. I had, had a seat. And, yeah. it, and it really threw me off when she said back seat. I was like, it doesn't have a back seat. She's like, no, come downstairs. It, it definitely does. It really messed me up. But, uh, oh, and I bought two new cars because I'm stupid. And no, you can't have any hints. When yeah. the cars arrive, you may have hints. Until then, <laughs> I don't talk. I don't talk about new cars I buy until they show up. That because because they could not. What if, what if the transporter gets run over? You know, mm-hmm. crashed yeah. into by a, a, a Tesla running full self driving software. I mean, it <laughs> might not show up ever. You never know. Um, <laughs> Matt Russell and Gavin, thank you, thank you very much Bit for pleasure. stopping by. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed our California roads. I love them. Uh, yeah. Love them. Yeah. I can't wait to uh, to meet you guys over in Hethel in March yep. and uh, drive the new car. Are we going to be allowed to drive uh, Via also ever? Is that I a would, thing? I would yes. imagine so. I hope yeah. so. Yes. I hope so. I hope we're on the approved lift for Avaya because I'd like to feel what zero to three hundred k in nine seconds feels like. Yeah, if you could tell me what that feels like, because then I'm not in the side next to you. So. I think you need a, <laughs> in America. Wouldn't you? Would you need a parachute for that here? If you ran that on an NHRA drag strip, you might need a parachute. I think if you're under nines, you need a cage. But I don't know if they changed that rule yet because they, they need to because they weren't prepared for cars that have like carbon cells and everything yeah. like that. But right now. I think if it's under nines, you need a cage. Under tens. We do, we do some dry lake bed, maybe. Some Bonneville or El Mirage. At the moment, as Matt said, is that we've got some amazing proving <laughs> grounds. You know, Nardo, you can see from space, apparently. You know, you can. Yeah, so that's, you know, you can you, the speed gets lost around there. So. Nardo the, is the pure Huge circle, bell, right? Yeah. yeah, it's just you just kind of point, point it straight. And point and go going. and watch the charge go down. <laughs> yeah. Just crazy. Yeah, yeah. That's, are we, well... You're, I'm sure you're not allowed to talk about that. I'm not even going to ask what the range is of your 2,000 horsepower car. Actually, I will. What's yeah. the range of your 2,000 horsepower car? Yeah, you know, 250 miles, you know. All right. Uh, normal driving. If you were driving, yeah. you know, uh, even enthusiastically around here, you know, 200 miles, stuff like that. So a good run out, 15, 20 minutes on a decent charger, and then yeah. 200 miles back home. Yeah. That's a good day out, isn't it? Two, I mean, 250 is a... Is, yeah, well, what we, the customer will expect. Yeah, and, it's a usable range. And at that point, you know, and if if you're driving at a performance level that's only gets you a hundred mile range, the concentration at that point is you're going to want a Red Bull or something yeah, at that point yeah, anyway. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you or you'll just be dripping other sweat products, the, yeah, <laughs> or any other energy drink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, <whoops. laughs> thanks, boys. That was great. We will see you all next week, and uh, we appreciate you asking your questions on the Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash the Smoking Tire Podcast. Goodbye. <laughs>